I got pulled over in Montana. They're saying my... I start my journey flying across the country from Boston to Portland, Oregon to pick up a beautiful rust-free truck that I just purchased at auction. Early the next morning, I arrived at the auction house and made my way to the vehicle in the lot. Well, here it is. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. I get a ton of questions about how I manage to buy vehicles at dealer-only auctions without a dealer's license. But before I get to that, let's get this thing started up, get it out of here. I'm gonna be driving this thing across the country. That's my goal anyway. So we need to take a look at it and make sure it's actually gonna make it. All right, key's in it. Let's see if the battery is good enough for it to start. Starts right up. Other than the fact that it's got no gas in it, oil pressure looks good, battery looks good, no warning lights on. This is good news. Well, first thing I noticed, we got a little bit of a tapping noise under here. It sounds like an exhaust leak to me, so I'm not too concerned about it. While we're at it, take a look at this frame. It's still got the sticker on it. This thing doesn't have an ounce of rust on it. Rocker panels, no rust. Oh my goodness, this thing is amazing. All right, it moves. How do I get out of here? Hello. Hello. How you doing, honey? Yeah. You got a license, hon? I do. Please and thank you. Good, put that in. Whew. Thank you. Yep. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, that one specifically. Well, that was easy. What's so special about this truck? Well, these GMT 800 series of trucks find that sweet spot of being modern enough, but not too modern. They're nice to drive, but not overly complicated. The engines, both gas and diesel options, are excellent. Frankly, they're very good at doing truck stuff, towing and hauling, without having to spend $70,000 on a new truck. This one cost $10,000, and if I didn't win it, it probably would have ended up on a used car dealer's lot with a price tag of $15,000 to $20,000. The one Achilles heel of these trucks is rust, which is why I've come to Portland to find a rust-free example. The first thing I noticed walking up to this vehicle was that this window here was down, and that's never a good sign when you see that at auctions, and I think yeah, I think the window regulator is bad on that. Luckily, that is kind of an easy, cheap fix, so I'm not too worried about it, but I'll hold this up with some duct tape, and that'll get me across the country anyway. See, I knew I brought duct tape for a reason. Let's pop the hood and check the fluids. Other than it being a little bit dusty, it looks super clean in here. Check the oil. The oil looks pretty good. Coolant. It's a little dirty in there, but the color is right and the level is, it's a hair low, but it's pretty good. Transmission, I mean, transmission fluid looks okay. Brake fluid, yeah, the level looks good. Power steering fluid, it looks like it's at the cold level, fluid looks good. Well, things are looking pretty good. Luckily, there's a Walmart right across the street, so I'm gonna head over there, grab some supplies, do an oil change on this thing real quick, and then I can start the 3,000 something mile trip home. It's got a magnetic drain plug. Awesome, I love that. Ooh. Holy guacamole, that filter is tight. Oh my goodness. Lubricate my seal here. Got a mobile one oil filter. Eight minutes so far on this oil change. That's not bad. We got mobile one, 5W30, full synthetic. Actually, this is the extended performance. All right, that looks pretty good. I'll check it again after running it, but it should be good. After changing the oil in the parking lot of what is frankly the worst Walmart I've ever been to, I started my eastbound journey. So I've been driving for a little while now down the stunningly beautiful Columbia River Valley, and the good news here is that the air conditioning works and the cruise control works. Those were two things that if they didn't work, this would be a miserable trip. So that's really good. And then the truck drives really well. It just seems like it was pretty well taken care of. 
There is one thing that is kind of annoying me and that is the electronic control, the button for the seat recline is broken off so I can't make the seat recline. I'm a little bit more upright than I'd like to be, but it's not too bad. I'll make it home just fine like this. So how did I buy this vehicle? I mean, you typically need a dealer's license to buy vehicles at auctions, and I don't have a dealer's license because they're very difficult to get. So instead I use a broker service. Now I'll put a link in the description in case you want to check them out, but it's a little known company called GoTo Auctions Now. They actually give you your own login to the two major salvage auctions, Copart and IAA, so you can search for vehicles and bid on them yourself. That's basically how I've gotten killer deals on vehicles like my S-Class for $4,100 and my Duramax for only $3,400. They can also help you bid on Odessa, which is the national wholesale auction where I got this truck. Now, I don't think GoTo Auctions Now has ever done any advertising, so it's mostly word of mouth and it really is a well-kept secret. In fact, I didn't find out about them until about a year ago when I was using a different broker, and I'm really glad I found them because they give you access to three auctions, they have very fair and transparent pricing, and their customer service is great. I'll put a link down in the description if you want to check them out, and you're welcome. I continued driving through the semi-arid steppe of eastern Washington, making my way towards the northernmost interstate route through the U.S. I'll drive through Washington, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, and Minnesota before heading south to the congested I-90 corridor through the rust belt of the U.S. and into New England. As I approached my overnight stop near the Washington-Idaho border, the weather got a little wetter and the landscape more forested. Good morning, day two of driving. I calculated my fuel economy after using my first tank of fuel and I averaged 14.6 miles per gallon, which that may not sound very good to you. However, for these trucks, it is actually pretty good. That's on the high end of what I was expecting, so I'm pretty happy about that. Driving through Montana, there was a state trooper currently driving in front of me that was previously running my plates. I could tell because the trooper was passing me in the left lane, but then stopped passing me and hung out diagonally behind me in the left lane. Eventually, the trooper drove ahead of me, so I thought I was in the clear. But then, as we approached a merge for road work, the trooper braked to merge behind me, which was a very suspicious move. Right after the road work ended, I found myself getting pulled over. I quickly gathered my documentation so it would be ready when the officer approached. Note that for this encounter, I only had a forward-facing camera rolling, but it did capture audio. How are you? Oh, I'm well, how are you? I'm well. So, I stopped you because uh, on your plates, it's coming back to not this truck. So I just wanted to confirm the VIN on it and stuff. Certainly, yes. Uh, to my documentation. Yeah, yep. Where'd you buy the truck at? So I got it from an auction in Portland. Okay. Um, it's registered to my dad. He's the one who bought it and I'm driving it back for him. Okay. Who's your dad? My dad is Okay. That's hopefully that's who it came back to. Nope. nope. It's not? Okay. Nope. Not a big deal though. I can All double right. check so, make sure things are good uh, though. Sorry. And then just your license as well, okay? Absolutely. So how'd you get to Oregon? I flew there. Okay. Something's um, missing. I'm sorry? Something's missing. What? That oh, my badass stash. stash. <laughs> it's got like this handlebar stash. Yeah. Powerful. Where? What's all the camera set up for? I am a YouTuber, so I'm just filming. Uh, basically. Gotcha. Cool. Hang tight for me, okay? All right, thank you. Well, I got pulled over in Montana. They're saying my plate doesn't match the vehicle. Not sure what the deal is with that. Uh, it should match the vehicle. Everything should be legal. So we're going to see what happens here. I'll keep you guys posted. All right, well, they let me go with no warning because everything's good. So I have a New Hampshire temporary license plate, which is, I guess, kind of suspicious because I'm in Montana and they've never seen one of those before, probably. So they ran my plate and apparently it came back to a blue Ford. Then it expired in 2015, I think she said. And obviously that's uh, a pretty suspicious, like, you know, what are you doing? So she pulled me over and, uh, and then she ended up running the truck's VIN and it came back to the correct license plate that I have. So everything's good. I think what New Hampshire does is they issue the same license plate number on their permanent plates and on their temporary plates. And so when she ran it, she ran it as a permanent plate and it came back as a different vehicle. So that's that. So I guess it's possible I could get pulled over again 
on this trip if any other cops run my plate. As the miles melted away, I got to enjoy the big skies of Montana, the badlands of North Dakota, the farmland of Minnesota, and the rolling hills of Wisconsin. Conveniently, while I'm in the area, I'm stopping to pick up some snow tires from Peter Zila. Got them all loaded up. Having a pickup is nice. Look at the tread on these too. They're like almost new. After I had the pleasure of driving the congested toll roads of Illinois, the toll roads of Indiana, the toll roads of Ohio, a little stint through Pennsylvania, and the toll roads of New York. Well, I made it back to New Hampshire successfully. Before I get to the mechanical repair section of this video, I wanna talk about the fuel economy, which was 14.1 miles per gallon across the country. The best segment was from Ohio to New York, where the speed limit was 65 miles per hour and it was fairly flat. I got 15.4 miles per gallon there, and the worst was 12.5 miles per gallon while I was booking it across Montana at 80 plus miles per hour. Now this truck can do 80 plus miles per hour, no problem. However, it has the four speed transmission, the 4L80E transmission, and the axle ratio on this is 410. So the RPMs at those speeds are pretty high. Like I said, it's doable, but your fuel economy does suffer a little bit. Let's get this truck in the shop and up on the lift so I can inspect it and do what is becoming my signature every fluid and filter service. First thing I like to do is get in here and check the wheels for tightness. Seems pretty good. I mean, there's usually a little bit of play in the steering. I don't know if that feels excessive. That, can you hear that? Or see that? That is really loose. This thing has a bad wheel bearing and I just drove across the country thousands of miles like that. That's a little bit sketch. Rear wheels are good. All right, front suspension. I like to get under here with a really big pair of pliers like this and check the tightness of the ball joints. There's like a really tiny, tiny amount of play there, but I don't think that's a big deal. That's just something to take note of and check again next year. Upper ball joint. The upper ball joint, I can see that the boot is torn and it's leaking grease. So that's something that's gonna wear out faster than it normally would. But the ball joint's tight, so that one's good. We'll just keep an eye on it. The CV boots are good. They're not torn or anything. The outer tie rod end here is covered in grease. Can you guys see that? It has a ton of play in the ball joint. So this outer tie rod end definitely needs to be replaced. I'm gonna do the inner tie rod ends as well. And in fact, I'm gonna do both sides while I'm at it since it needs an alignment when you do this. Front drive shaft, U joints look good. Rear drive shaft, one of those nice big aluminum ones. Ball joints look good on this too. I think this exhaust is the original factory exhaust and it's just, it's not rusty, it's, it's perfect. The frame, it's just, there's a little bit of like mud on it. If that's not rust, that's mud. You can still see the original wax coating on it from the factory. It's so beautiful. This truck is gonna be so nice to work on. All right, watch this rear shock back here. Pretty sure that shock is no good. The one on this side looks like it's rubbing here and it's not moving at all. Definitely I'm gonna replace both sides. While I'm waiting for parts to come in, I'll start by changing the transmission fluid and filter. First, I need to remove the transmission cross member. Unfortunately, this pan does not have a drain plug, so I have to do it the messy way. Oh, jeez. Yep. There we go. Grab the old filter. All right, we got a Wix transmission filter. Look at that, perfect fit. Before reinstalling the transmission oil pan, I made sure to clean it very well, including cleaning the magnet. What do you know? It's one of those old fashioned vehicles that you fill through the transmission dipstick. It's very convenient. No special tools required. You just gotta pour really slowly, that's all.
With the transmission mostly filled, it's safe to start the engine and go through the gears, which fills up the valve body so I can get an accurate fluid level measurement. And with the engine running, I can check the level. And that actually looks pretty good. While I'm back here, I want to do the transfer case. I'm going to remove the fill plug first, just to make sure I can get it out. Well, it came out easily. It's definitely completely full because some fluid's coming out of there. a little bit of a sketchy way to fill this but you know you got to do what you got to do it's gonna take a long time too much later looks like we're full well that was easy okay rear differential is next i don't even have to remove the rear cover here because there's a drain plug right here on the bottom and then right here on the side there's a fill plug it's fantastic That oil looks pretty good. I forgot to remove the fill plug first, but it'll probably be okay. This oil looks so good that I'm just gonna put the drain plug back in. Normally I'd let it drain out a little bit more than that, but I don't think there's really any need here. I love the smell of gear oil in the morning. We're full. like one of the easiest differential oil changes I've ever done. Okay, front differential. If you have one of these trucks and you've never changed the front differential, you really should because these things tend to get really nasty. There's the fill plug. Oh yeah, that's nasty. It's not the worst I've ever seen, but it's got a lot of metal in it. Yep, that's full. So these lug studs right here, they match the rear of the vehicle and there's a little bit of, not bad, but a little bit of corrosion on it. So I can tell this is the original wheel bearing hub assembly. 129,000 miles now on the assembly before it needed to be replaced. That's not too, too bad. I'd hope for a little bit longer from quality bearings, but it's better than the 20 or 30,000 miles that you might get from cheap Chinese bearings. So I'll take it. Over here on the driver's side, these studs look brand new and they do not match the rest of the vehicle. So I can tell that this wheel bearing hub assembly has been replaced already. So I am going to bleed the brakes now. And before I do that, I wanna pump as much of the old brake fluid out of the brake fluid reservoir so that I'm not wasting brake fluid and running a bunch of old fluid through the system. The color of the brake fluid is not great. It's not the worst I've seen, but it's kind of dark. So I think this definitely needs to be done. All right, pressure brake bleeder. These things are so nice to have. Got an adapter to work with these GMs. Might work for other stuff too, I don't know. Pump it up to what, like 15 or 20 PSI? All right, you always start bleeding on the wheel farthest from the reservoir. That would be this one, the rear right. All I have to do is open up this bleed screw here. Oh, look at that, that is dark fluid. Once the fluid starts looking clean, then I know that the fresh fluid is in here and I can close this up and be done. Yeah, that looks pretty clean. Just close this bad boy up and onto the next wheel. So easy to do. All right, while I'm doing the fluids, I'm also gonna drain the coolant. There's not really any easy way to do this. It's gonna make a mess. Ugh. There's, is there even a point to this? I'm trying to collect this fluid. This is unbelievable. Such a mess. I'm gonna go take a shower now while this drains.
Okay, rear shocks. Let's get these off and see if my diagnosis was correct. Yep. Easy peasy. Next, replacing the front right wheel bearing. When you're removing these axle nuts, I like to take a screwdriver or a punch or something and throw it in the vented rotors, and that way this rotor can't spin. Oh, wow, that nut was not very tight. These caliper bracket bolts can be really difficult to do if you don't have a lift because if they're, you're only on jack sands and you're, you know the ground is like right here, you don't really have a lot of room to get in here with a huge breaker bar to put the right amount of force on these bolts. So having a lift definitely makes this a lot easier. There we go. They were tight, but at least they weren't gonna fall off. I hope this doesn't come flying off oh. like that. There we go. While I have such easy access, I want to get the tie rod in here too. That's not very tight. That was the easiest tie rod end removal I've ever seen. To make it easier to remove next time, I'm using Permatex copper anti-seize on the splines. So this goes like this, I think. I'm going to reuse the old brake rotors because they're still in pretty good shape. Use pretty much anything as a hammer. I don't want to forget to add coolant before running the engine. Changing spark plugs. This truck has a ton of space in the engine compartment for this kind of job. This magnetic socket here, these things are amazing when it comes to this kind of a task. I'll put a link to those down in the description because you never know when you're gonna to have to change a set of spark plugs. and the spark plug comes right out with it. Awesome. Holy guacamole. These are like the second most worn out spark plugs I have ever seen. Take a look at that electrode. These things are incredibly worn down. In fact, I'm amazed that the truck is running as well as it is with spark plugs this bad.
Just for comparison, you can see the electrode on these two spark plugs, the old one and the new one. The gap is supposed to be really small, as you can see by the one on the right, whereas it's totally worn out on the left. I have a top tip for dealing with spark plugs. First of all, buy a diesel so you don't have to deal with this at all. But if you insist on having a gasoline engine, buy the quality, long-lasting spark plugs. These are NGK Iridium. These things last, is it 60,000 miles, maybe more than that. If you buy the cheap copper spark plugs, you're just going to have to change them again. And they're going to look like this and all worn out on you in no time. If you're going to go through all the labor of changing spark plugs, you might as well just do it with spark plugs that are going to last a long time. On this truck, these are easy to change, but on some vehicles, they're not so easy to change. My Mercedes S-Class comes to mind. Always screw your spark plugs in by hand so you don't cross-thread them and ruin your cylinder head. And then you can go ahead and torque them. Click, click. It should be tight enough. I kind of want to start it up and see if it runs better. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's running fine. It still has that exhaust leak, so it doesn't sound great, but it is running well. Speaking of exhaust leak, that's next. When I had this truck up on the lift, I used my nifty mechanics stethoscope here to pinpoint the exact spot where the exhaust leak is coming from. It's all the way on the end of the exhaust manifold. This thing is seriously worth its weight in gold. I couldn't help but notice this exhaust manifold hardware is suspiciously new looking. Would you believe it? This bolt in the back is not even tight. So that is why it's leaking, and I think I can probably just tighten it up without replacing the gasket, but we'll see if that fixes it. It's possible that the exhaust leaking around the gasket could have ruined the gasket, but we'll find out. That's tight. All right, let's start it up and see if that fixed the exhaust leak. Yeah, it purrs like a kitten now. There's no ticking noise. That's amazing. Up next, time to change this window regulator. I have to pull off this door panel. Summer is a really nice time for this kind of a job because plasticky things tend to be more plasticky and less likely to break. There are two bolts holding this on here and here, but apparently they're broken because this just comes right off. And uh, yeah, I guess it makes my life easier. It looks like it has been done before. I wonder if they did a bad job or if they just installed a cheap part and it broke already. Oh, maybe the same guy who did the exhaust manifold did this and that's why it's not working. That's probably what it is. Two bolts here, one here and here to remove the window from the regulator. You don't have to remove the bolt, you just gotta get it loose. Look at that, it just falls right down. Yeah, that, that must be a snapped cable. Yeah. There we go, it's a little bit of a puzzle, but it's really not too bad. So here's the new part, it comes with a motor, so I don't have to transfer the motor over. Maybe I've been working on too many Land Rovers and Mercedes, but that was really easy to install. I guess I did a good job of duct taping it. Look at that. Excellent. Well, this truck is ready to go for hopefully many years of reliable service. My dad is certainly very excited to take delivery of his new truck. If you guys like this kind of content, let me know down in the comments because this truck could be back on the channel for future projects like, for example, building a headache rack or something like that. 
in every video that I've been posting lately, I've been getting a lot of comments asking when part three of the Gooseneck Trailer build series is coming up. Thank you so much for your comments and showing of interest, by the way. That really does help me prioritize things. I have started filming part three of the Gooseneck Trailer build series when, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but I bought this and had to switch to this project because it's time sensitive. But starting tomorrow, I'm getting back onto the Gooseneck Trailer build. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.